welcome to the University of Wollongong Library um, and to this special event um, in the library of the Nitsu Room, uh, where we're looking, we're contributing to our program for Mining the Landscape Coal and Illawarra Exhibition. As we begin, I would like to start off with an acknowledgement of country. The University of Wollongong Library acknowledges the traditional custodians, the Aluri, the Wadiwadi and the Durrabal people on whose land we stand on today. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and those of the future. Thank you for joining us for this event and I'm delighted to see so many people here and I would particularly like to acknowledge some of our guests, the historian Ron Kens, who's editor of um, books on the history of coal mining in the Illawarra, Southern Highlands and Burrow of Garan Valley. And he's also the project manager of the Illawarra Heritage Trail. Andy Hobsher, chairman of the Mineral Heritage Subcommittee. Graham Pryor, alumni and secretary of the Mineral Heritage Subcommittee and a member of the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. We have um, a number of UOW engineering staff here, Dr. Jan Nim Chip and Professor, Professor Naj Aziz. And we also welcome um, Bob um, Kimonku from the Mineral Heritage Subcommittee. We thank you for joining us for this special presentation, Connections and Recollections, as will be presented by Mr. Raymond Tolhurst. Um, this was a really um, special exhibition to pull together and we're delighted that we have many of you in this room who can continue the conversation and actually contribute to the narrative that's been collected here as part of this exhibition. Much of this material has been brought together by our staff and our collections within the University of Wollongong Archives. But also we do pay tribute to the Illawarra Historical Society for their generous um, loan of artefacts and objects to complement the exhibition. It's really important that we make um, our content discoverable, accessible and, and usable and this has been enabled through the digitisation of a number of our collections and, and artefacts and also the bringing together of um, key people who can tell the story much more eloquently than, than I can at this point in time. We have today can I call him Ray? Yes. Ray. Um, Mr. Ray Tolkers. Ray is known well to, to many of you in this room. Um, you, we know that he's a casual lecturer and, and an honorary fellow at the University School of Civil Mining and Environmental Engineering. And he holds many family connections to our Illawarra mining industry dating back to the mid-1800s and the commencement of all I mine. Ray has many accolades against his name, but I think the key things I'd like to highlight um, in this introduction for Ray are the awards that he has um, attained during his career, such as the Beryl Jacker National Award offered in 2016 for sustained high-level service to the Australian um, IMM, Outstanding Learning and Teaching Award 2014, um, offered through the Commonwealth Government for employability skills in mining and materials, metallurgy and engineering programs. And I've heard you speak very passionately about work integrated learning and placements in other fora. Um, he's received an outstanding contribution to teaching and learning by a part-time or casual lecturer in 2013 by the University of The Australian Coal Operators Conference offered him an award in 2012 for his contribution to mining education um, the Australian um, IMM offered him an award in 2010 for um, the National Institute Services Award and he also uh, received the Services to Students Medal in, 20, in 2006 by the New South Wales Department of Education and Training. We have um, a leader in our mix, um, a person who is very passionate about um, mining in the Illawarra and we all await to hear from you, Ray. Please welcome Ray. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. I've just been very fortunate to work with a lot of talented people and uh, in many ways feed off them. Preparing for this talk has been a, a really daunting task. There's just so much Illawarra heritage attached to mining, 
and it's very important but difficult to give the topic justice. My granddaughter actually gave me the best piece of advice. She said, Grandpa, just simply do your best and forget the rest. <laughs> so here goes. <laughs> Mining the landscape has got a range of dimensions. There's obviously the, the geographic dimension, there's a community and social dimension, a technical dimension, an industrial dimension, and what you're going to hear as well today, a family dimension. This exhibition that's around the walls and my talk try to blend these dimensions together over time. And there are obviously different perspectives on this story, so I'm presenting it based on my family's anecdotes and my observations. Personally, what these photos around the walls represent is how coal mining has been a key part of the story of Illawarra and my family for over 150 years. So in our case, involving six generations. But it's the story of a fairly typical local coal mining family and how it's been in intertwined with the landscape of coal mining and the community. Actually, the story goes back 24 years before mining commenced in, in the Illawarra, when Thomas Chilby, a ticket of leave convict, settled in Bulli in August 1834. He'd been transported to Sydney for stealing a sheep. His sentence was actually death but it was commuted to transportation for life, and as a ticket of leave convict, that meant that if he returned to England, the original sentence of death would have been carried out. So, the first of our six generations involved in coal mining was his son, Thomas Chilby. My great-great-grandfather, also named as a Thomas. He started the Bulleye Mine when it opened in 1859, and coal miners at that time did many jobs because mining was an intermittent industry only needed when there was a, uh, a ship at the jetty. So he also did carpentry and timber building. He died in 1908 and his headstone is still intact in St Augustine's uh, Church, Park Road, Bulloy. He's buried there near many of his mates, oops, near many of his mates who uh, passed away in the Bulloy mine disaster on the 23rd of March. 1887, which is depicted on the back wall. Among those killed was Elijah Pocket, my sister-in-law's great-grandfather. So this is a photo of the memorial to those um, uh, 81 miners that died in that disaster. The actual mine explosion was caused by his daily safety lamp, or one like this. The miners, the only light they had at the face was the light coming from uh, the, the daybeam lamp. They didn't have cat lamps. And as the uh, daybeam lamp got uh, dusty, they couldn't see because there wasn't very much light coming out, so they would remove the gauze. Once you remove the gauze, you can understand what would happen in a gassy mine when there was any sort of heat. And that's what set off that explosion. Neither remembered that this disaster occurred just a few months after the miners had returned to work after a long prolonged strike. During the strike, the mine owner had thrown the miners' families out of their rented cottages and forced them to live in tents. They were short of money when they returned to work and they were only paid for the coal that they produced, so unfortunately, safety seems as if it's been compromised. It's interesting to note, the Davy safety lamp is what is used to transport the Olympic flame from continent to continent nowadays. Interesting little hot solo. <coughs> the other story which tells the culture of the time is that when the miners' bodies were brought out to the surface, the mine manager asked the assembled ladies would they go to the local Callop store and buy calico to make shrouds for the bodies. They did this and then the mine owners refused to pay for the calico because they didn't have to. Culture of the time. The other notable community and social thing about the Bulleye Mine disaster is that within a few months it resulted in two of the longest serving community organisations starting in the district. The Winona Bulleye St John's Ambulance Brigade and the Winona Salvation Army, both being amongst the first of those organisations started in Australia and both having an ongoing tradition of working with the coal mining industry and meeting other local community needs. 
The second generation. Uh, the second generation of our family was Fred Chilby and Ephraim Tolhurst. Both of my great grandfathers, shown in this photo, worked in the coal industry. This photo, as it says, is of the Tolhurst family picnic at Slacky Flat in about 1919. My great grandfathers are standing at opposite ends Fred Chilby at this end, and Ephraim Tolhurst at this end. And why are they standing at opposite ends? <laughs> Oops. Fred Tolhurst, so Fred Chilby, tall man, local town drunk. Ephraim Tolhurst came to the Illawarra to help establish the Salvation Army. <laughs> but in the middle are their two wives, my great grandmothers, they were great friends. Ephraim Tolhurst finished up being dusted from South Bly Nine and then worked at the, uh, the gatekeeper's house at the Princess Highway, which is still there today. And you can just see it, if you go out to the Russell Isle Colliery, just in there is the original gatekeeper's house, which is still there after 100 years. As I said, on the other end of the, the spread, uh, Chilby, he worked as a, um, a diver at the Boy Coal Work. This is a photo of Fred at Sandon Point, quite different from the way it is now with all the modern houses. Fred was a very strong man. He carried railway sleepers from station to station to win bets. <laughs> he was still alive when I was a child, not to remember him telling the stories about the other jobs he used to do, particularly he used to put fences around houses. And one of his stories was he claimed that he was the Australian champion fencer. And in fact that he could fence so far in one day it took him two days to walk back. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to cheat. <laughs> Just a little bit. He used to make his, he said he used to make his post holes the night before and carry them with him in the sugar bag and just put the holes wherever he wanted them. <laughs> Another of his tales was when he was working as a, a diver and things were quiet at the Bullock Coal Wharf, he would hitch up a pair of seahorses and go for a ski through the ocean. <laughs> now, if you know the size of seahorses, <laughs> but he had us as kids in fascination. <laughs> the next slide shows the skip that miners at that time used to fill. This is uh, from the miners' cottage out of Bulleye. The skip held about one tonne of coal and the target or dar for a pair of miners, one cutting coal with a pick, the other loading the coal with a shovel, was about 16 of these skips a day. And that's what they got paid on. Not on hourly wages, they got paid on what they produced. Interestingly enough, during this period, industrially, and as I said, there is an industrial dimension to this history, the Illawarra coal miners were part of the movement that won sick leave and long service leave, legacies that we still have today. I'm going just back for a minute. At the back of this photograph, holding the young child, is my grandfather, George Tollers. A part of the third generation of the family, George Tollers and Austin Noble. George was also a coal miner, and as shown in this and the next photo, uh, he, and, along with other Tolhurst family members, were part of the Wollongong or Wollongong Town Bank and the Wollongong the Soccer Team. Uh, things like this were very much part of the local coal mining scene at the time. Uh, part of the social and community landscape at the time. There wasn't television and other forms of uh, mass entertainment. So the coal mining communities developed interest in social and sporting activities to bring their community together. My grandfather's other job outside of coal mining was as a grave digger for Parsons funerals. And a local saying in the North Illawarra for paupers burials at the time was, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, 
If Parsons won't bury you, George Tolworth must. <laughs> Around this period, my other grandfather, Austin Noble, migrated from Yorkshire and worked as a coal miner initially at Balgowney. With the outbreak of the First World War, the less steamships come to the Illawarra and work in the mines became irregular. And like many of the Balgowney coal miners, he joined the army to get a regular paycheck for his family. He went to the Western Front, and he, like many of the other Balgany boys, were used as tunnelers. He was gassed in the tunnel and returned a war casualty. And the figures show the impact. Of 120 Balgany coal miners that went to the First World War as tunnelers, 90 were killed or injured. Horrific. Going back once again, at the front of this photo is my father, Jack Tolbert. Then age seven. Three years after this photo was taken, at the age of ten, Dad started working as a, in the coal industry as a wheeler, clipper and ventilation door attendant. Working at Clifton and Scarborough mines, he walked along the railway line to and from work for these mines from Bernardo. Through the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, Dad and several of my uncles continued to work in coal mines, taking part in the early mechanisation of our coal industry. Moving back along again. This is a photo from that time showing the boys who worked as clippers and whirlers, vent door attendants. It's not, it's come from the uh, Miners Memorial at Tarawana. What's noticeable about it? Have a look at the safety gear. Have a look at their faces. The mines, most mines at that time had no facilities for washing after shift. So, very similar to what my father would have been doing at that time. Also, there was great camaraderie between the miners and their pit horses. And uh, again, this comes from uh, the Memorial of Tarawana. Uh, it shows a miner and a horse having cribbed together. And during this period, the coal mining industry contributed to Illawarra's social development landscape through the establishment of things like the Schools of Arts and WEA, so that uh, miners and, and other families could uh, go through lifelong education and personal enrichment. Industrially, just after the Second World War, there was a major event, the Great Coal Strike of 1949. The coal mining unions at the time was acknowledged were led by communists and they fiercely opposed the mechanisation of the coal industry, claiming that it would lead to massive unemployment at miners. This was sort of led to the strike and the Commonwealth Government passed legislation making it illegal for anyone or any organisation to provide any form of support for striking coal miners and their families. And that meant that our family who had a large backyard vegetable patch that we could have been charged or fined for passing fruit and vegetables over the fence to our neighbours who were a strike and coal miner. Should we have obeyed the law and let our neighbours' family starve? This is still a contentious political issue today. When is it okay to break a seriously flawed law? Still topical now. The other major impact on the coal mining industry in the Illawarra during this time was the establishment of the Joint Coal Board. Immediately after the Second World War, the amount of coal produced was inadequate to meet post-war redevelopment. Coal is an essential resource for electricity, gas production, rail transport, steel production, cement manufacturing, as well as fishing bunkers. And action was desperately needed to improve production, efficiency, upgrade mine and community facilities and provide better health and workers' compensation services. So the Commonwealth Government and the New South Wales Government jointly agreed to establish the Joint Coal Board, and they gave it quite unusual wide sweeping powers. They had powers over virtually every aspect of the New South Wales coal industry, including control over mining methods, operating times, the opening and closing of coal mines, the distribution of coal, including its purchase and sale, regulation of prices, employment in mines, and the power to acquire and operate any mine uh, or to manage any mine. 
One of the aspects um, that's important for the period is when the Joint Coal Board began operations, the general standard of pit amenities through the industry was poor. Only three local mines had change houses to have a wash or shower when you completed the shift. More than half the mines didn't have a satisfactory supply of drinking water at the surface. So the board acted to improve these amenities to the extent of issuing formal directions to mine orders. The board also provided funds to local government authorities to improve facilities such as water and sewage schemes, community halls such as this one shown at Russell Isle, recreation facilities, libraries, parks and gardens. And this is an important part of the Illawarra mining landscape. Many of the amenities that we use today came from the joint coal board period of then providing the finances or the mines doing things such as all the Dalton Park sporting facilities, the Russell Vale Golf Course, all done by the local coal industry and as part of our recreational landscape. In fact, it's only recently in 2002 that the joint coal board um, ceased to exist with its functions and assets moving to coal services a 50-50 partnership between the New South Wales Minerals Council and the CFMEU, the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union. One of the other key things is that the board set up a medical service to undertake regular periodical medical examinations of the workforce, examine new entrants and to advise on all aspects of health in the industry. Dust has been a major problem in mines because of very limited dust control measures that were in place at the time. <coughs> and to improve the health, the Joint Coal Board introduced coal services, coal health services, and worked with state governments to establish the Mines Rescue Service. As seen, these are now co-located out of Manuna. The Board looked for export opportunities to absorb excess capacity, in particular identified Japan as a major area for growth. And so the 1960s and 70s were a period of virtually uninterrupted growth for the coal industry, particularly in exports to Japan. And just two family anecdotes about this period of mechanization, mechanization in the late 50s to the early 70s. First, my uncle Charlie, mum's brother, he drove a shovel cart at the old Bulleye mine. The roadways at this time were quite bumpy, and the shovel cart driver stood at the side of the machine. The miners at this time opposed safety hats, claiming that it made them hot and sweaty. So they invented, well, they didn't invent, but they adapted those from the British tradition. <laughs> While we may laugh, the result of having a safety hat like this, driving a shuttle car at excessive speed on a bumpy road, he got lifted out of the, the driver's position smashed his head against the roof and unfortunately was killed. And this was not un unusual for families in the 50s, 60s and 70s to have had a relative killed or seriously injured in a coal mine. The, uh, at the back of the, uh, the miners' cottage at Bulleye, there is this wall which contains the names of the local, of the miners that have been killed in local coal mines. It's a very moving experience to go and read the names on those plaques. I don't know what the actual total is now, Bob, but be well under the 300, 400, something of that order. Yeah. The other anecdote is about another uncle, Bonnie Noble. He was a deputy or leading hand at South Bulleye. When continuous miners were introduced, to slow down productivity, miners would often cut air rather than cut coal. So they have them working, but they're just spinning it out rather than cutting the coal. In the previous convict tradition, where an owner would choose one of the convicts to be an overman to make the others work, mine owners did the same. Um, my uncle body become an open to make the deputies and the mining crews work harder. Needless to say, he wasn't popular, and after a few years, the Joint Coal Board banned the practice of having open. 
In the early 1970s, to further increase productivity, long wall mining was introduced to Australia, with the first long walls installed locally, and depending on who you talk to, either Coldcliffe or South Bullard was the first. And, oops, I don't know what's going on there. It is. And uh, one of the early hydraulic uh, supports can still be seen um, in the park on the southern side of the Russell Isle Golf Course. Which brings you to the fifth generation, me. The establishment of the University of Wollongong has been a key part of the, the local mining landscape. The land that the university is on was donated by the mining industry. In part, UAW was established to provide highly skilled technical staff for mining and its downstream steel producers. A key part that the University of Wollongong has played and has impacted on me personally was the start of the New South Wales, now the Australian Coal Preparation Society. It was initiated by one of UAW's early professors, Bill Upfold and Roger Gaston from BHP. This resulted in the design of a New South Wales coal preparation course that I adapted to be a TAFE program. I delivered, had the great fortune to deliver it all over New South Wales, including on one occasion delivering it for a group of uh, technical salespeople and designers at Sydney Technical College in Albemarle on a Friday night from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock at the back of Tankwood's Meatworks. <laughs> now, not surprising, the students after the first night with the lovely aromas of uh, meat and meatworks <laughs> weren't keen to come back for the second occasion. But as they were all sales representatives, they had quite a reasonable sort of uh, marketing budget. So they tapped me on the shoulder and said, Ray, content's fine, location allows it. So for the next 15 weeks, that course continued over a Chinese banquet every Friday night down in Dickinson Street, <laughs> with a different company paying for it. <laughs> now, with, with mechanisation, oh, I should say that in running the coal preparation courses on mine sites in washeries, a lot of them are quite noisy, quite dirty. So I had to improvise the teaching equipment. And I still use it. I get teased by my colleagues about my briefcase. But as you can see, it's been around the, <laughs> been around the world a couple of times. But it's fantastic for taking the mine sites because if you go underground and get put on the, the floor of a personnel carrier, people can put their boots over it and stuff inside is still fine. The other piece of equipment that I found invaluable was my mobile whiteboard. <laughs> when you go around wa washeries, um, it's very noisy, it's very hard to listen to anybody, I could pull out my mobile whiteboard and play teacher. And it was very effective. Now, as I said, sort of, this period of uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, Huge amount of mechanisation, introduction of long wall mining, and with long wall mining, the shearer blade just takes what's in front of it. Coal, stone, shale, a lot. So, whereas with manual mining, the miners could actually physically see differences in coal and stone and separate some of underground, can't with mechanised mining. So that this increased the need for coal preparation to be able to produce a quality product. So, I've got with me a piece of coal, a piece of stone, apart from the colour. Let's see if one of our audience can tell me something significantly different. <laughs> What's significantly different? The weight. The weight, the density. And that's the basis of most of our coal preparation. The stone is heavier than the coal. So if we make up a suspension of uh, fine uh, material in water, has a density in between the two, the coal will float, the shale will sink, and hence we can separate them. But it's not quite that simple. Not quite that simple. What we're able to develop are watchability curves, which enable, provide us with the technology to be able to manage and get the best out of the coal. And it's basically these curves which now drive our local Illawarra coal mining industry. And to explain very briefly how they're used, 
Who wants to be a cold customer? Who's going to be a cold customer? Thank you, Naj, putting up the hand. <laughs> okay, Naj. Okay. Along the bottom is an axis showing the amount of ash or stone or dirt that the product will contain. You pick a figure of how much ash you're prepared to have in your coal. 8%. 8%. Okay, so, so if Naj gets a coal of 8%, we would get a yield of 82%, and the density of separation that we would need is about 1.8. So make up the bar of magnetite, find out the type of water, for density of 1.8, we know that we would get that 82% yield, we would have 8% ash, and Naj goes away a happy customer. Yay! <laughs> But we also know that the, the ash in the heaviest piece of coal to flight would be just about 44, and that the ash in the stone would be about well, just over 75. So we might be able to make a second product suitable for generating electricity in this range, yeah. would mean we'd need to use a higher density, so a second bar, and that the final coal wash would have an ash up here around about 80%, which we need to get somewhere up near there to avoid the coal wash undergoing spontaneous combustion. Now, what I've just summarised is half a semester's work for mining engineers. <laughs> but this is what is now driving our local Illawarra coal industry the understanding of these watchability curves. Right, the sixth generation, my son Anthony. He was very lucky, very fortunate to complete, complete a mining engineering degree here at Wollongong due to the efforts of people like Naj. He wasn't the best of students. He would have got a, he would have got a straight distinctions if they gave him that are reading the back of bourbon bottles at Uni Bar, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For a short time, he did vacation employment at Metropolitan Colliery in Helensburg. Unfortunately, he risked the potential to become known locally as Little Ray. So he went into metal mining, and he's currently the superintendent of project scheduling at BHP's Olympic Mine, uh, Olympic Dam Mine in South Australia. So I've gone through basically the heritage it's worthwhile just finishing up for five, a couple of minutes on what's the future. What will the future mining landscape show? What photos will be around these walls in 50 years' time? Many of them are likely to revolve around the coal industry's relationship with the university and the professional body, the OSIWM, the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. Also, increasingly, the Illawarra's mining landscape involves industrial minerals and quarrying. We're a major source of building and transport materials for the Sydney market. It's also no accident that UOW's top current departmental ranking in the World QS rankings is for mining engineering. It's something that the university, the local coal industry and the profession can be proud of, but it shouldn't be taken for granted. We've got a ranking that's higher than any mining engineering program in the United Kingdom or China and is in fact the world's top ranking regional mining program. The world's top regional mining program. The only ones that are higher than us are in either state capitals or national capitals. And what's contributed to this emerging mining landscape based on the interaction with the university? It's things like the annual Australian Coal Operators Conference held in February each year here at UAW. It's the longest standing annual professional conference held in Wollongong each year. A significant con contributor to that other part of the Illawarra's emerging landscape, tourism. It's the Australian Coal Re Association's research program, ACAR, that UAW is leading, such as equipment organisation organization and utilisation, polymer spray wall and roof support that UAW is licensed to BASF, the world's second largest chemical company. It's the development of the world's first standard testing for cable box. It's Illawarra Oz Dublin paying for mining students' mine planning room, equipped with the latest industry software. 
It's Associate Professor Anna Sparky, the Chair of the World Council of APCOM, the, for four years, 2015 to 19, the application of computers and operational research in the minerals industry that brings the latest research and software to UAW's teaching programs. Yes, truly, Illawarra's mining landscape and UAW are closely interlinked now and into the future. Thank you.